Uh, my name is Paul Coyer. I'm a research professor here at the Institute of World Politics. As you can see, soy mucho, mucho gringo, pero mi esposa es venezolana, so I'm a lucky guy. And this is why I have become uh, very attached to what happens in Venezuela. Um, my wife, Marjorie, and I have gotten to know uh, some of you in the crowd as well as Vanessa over the last uh, year or two. Uh, and I'm always impressed by the caliber of people from Venezuela that we meet. Uh, and one of the sad things I have to say about what's happening down there is the loss of human capital. Such amazingly talented people that have had to flee. Um, a brief word about the, uh, about the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who have not been here before, we are not a think tank. A lot of people think we are a think tank. Uh, we do indeed think, but we are a graduate school. We have uh, several master's degrees, two-year master's degrees, uh, I think 17 one-year master's graduate certificates, and just started a PhD program in national security uh, about a year ago. Um, but, uh, Vanessa Neumann is an authority on Latin American politics and security, um, as well as on international criminal networks. She just came out with a very good book in, I think, April, called The Blood Prophets. No, in December. I actually launched it here. I oh, know you spoke here, yeah. Okay, yeah. blood prophets. There you go. <laughs> I've got it on my bedside stand. Uh, and uh, as I understand, the Brazilian version is coming out in two or three weeks. Yeah, Brazilian. Uh, yeah, uh, the twenty fifth. Okay. November. And yeah. Espanol. We're we're talking to publishers, two or three different publishers. We're okay. Negotiating. All right. We're anyway. Little afraid. Uh, that book, a lot of personal research went into it. Went to some very scary places, met some scary people, and lived to tell about it. Uh, and that book is a, pro a product of, of all that personal research and a lot of great analytical ability. Um, Dr. Neumann is also the co-author of The Many Criminal Heads of the Golden Hydra, Asymmetrica and the Counter-Extremism Project. Uh, Asymmetrica is her firm that she founded and, had, and leads. Um, the book was an extensive analysis of illicit trade and corruption in the tri-border area. Uh, she has served for four years on the OECD's task force on countering illicit trade <coughs> since its inception and on their advisory group. She holds a PhD, so she's not just Vanessa, she's Dr. Vanessa, <laughs> in political philosophy from Columbia University with fellowships at Yale University, um, Columbia as well, and the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Her company, Asymmetrica, that I just referenced, is a member of the Global Counterterrorism Research Network. I won't go through the acronym, there are too many acronyms in Washington anyway. Uh, for the United Nations Security Council's Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate, which is a mouthful, uh, but very important group. Um, Dr. Neumann also was, uh, is, was an academic reviewer for USOCOM's ARIS series, Teaching Manual on Counterinsurgency in Colombia. Um, the last sentence here says that she's uh, the obvious. She's a widely sought after speaker to media, academia, and government. Um, I was uh, in my gym about a month ago and I look up and there's Fox News and Vanessa on there. <laughs> so she does that quite a bit. So without further ado, we have a, a great pleasure uh, to welcome Dr. Vanessa Norman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to the IWP for hosting me, for Paul for putting this together, and uh, for all of you for caring enough about Venezuela to be here today. Um, as Paul said, I'm Vanessa Neumann, President of Asymmetrica, author of Blood Prophets, but most of all, I am Venezolana. So when I was a child in Caracas, we had a joke that God had been terribly unfair when he created the world because Venezuela was so blessed. It had incredible beauty, the Amazon, the Andes, the Caribbean, and untold riches, oil, gas, iron, gold, whatever you needed, it like fell to you like manna from heaven. We were so wrapped in a sense of prosperity. To us, it was the promised land. It was also the promised land to, my, to the Neumann family, to my grandparents, who barely survived the Holocaust, and then realized in 1948, when the Soviets started throwing opposition leaders out windows and saying they jumped, which we're now seeing happen in Venezuela, they hatched a plan that they could no longer live under oppression and found a way to get them and their infant son to Venezuela. And my father grew up there and considered himself Venezuelan. When the tide of history turned, we were so grateful to Venezuela and so 
thankful for all its prosperity and what it had given to us, and it's so in our bloodstream by now, that when history turned and Václav Havel, the Iron Curtain fell, and Václav Havel went from a prison cell to the presidential palace in Prague, he sent his first foreign minister, Dean Speer, to, on a tour of Latin America. In Caracas, they arrived at our house, and we had a big fancy white tie dinner for the foreign minister, and halfway through he says, Mr. Neumann, I have a gift for you from President Havel. We are, have offered to give you back the properties that were taken from your family from, by the Nazis, and then from the, passed on from the Nazis to the Soviets. And my grandfather, who spoke, who loved Venezuela, and spoke to, in a very heavy Czech accent though, he leaned back in his chair, crossed his arms, and he said, no, thank you, sir. I left that all behind. Venezuela is my country now. It is the country that took me in as an immigrant. It is the country that gave me prosperity. And it is the country I love. And he never looked back. I would first came to the U.S. when I was 10 years old. It was supposed to be one year of study in the U.S. For various reasons, it became longer study in the U.S. And I wept every night for the first year that I wanted to go home, I wanted to go back to Caracas, until my mother finally gave me a puppy for me to stop crying. But there are so many of us now that comparing the country that was then to the country that is now, so much of us, so many of us want to go back to our country and help it rebuild. As you may have heard, it's in a horrible situation. We had, the government took over our means of production and exchange with 1,400 companies expropriated, 4 million hectares of arable land. We now have a famine where two-thirds of Venezuelans have lost 24 pounds over the last year because they can't find enough to eat. We now see the cruelty of hunger as a tool of political oppression. They give, the military comes and gives little inadequate boxes of food or other stuff they choose to give you that's inadequate to feed your family, but only if you swear an oath of fealty to the regime. And those people have taken 70% of the value of that box to feed themselves. So they profit off our starvation. And our starvation is their tool for our oppression. Make no mistake, I consider this a slow motion genocide. Our hyperinflation is at a million percent a year and is projected to be 10 million percent next year in 2019 by the IMF. That is well into Weimar Republic numbers. The Weimar Republic gave us Hitler. In our country, it has thrown our economy back into a barter economy. One third of Venezuelans have said they plan to leave, are making plans to leave the country. That's 10 million people. That is double the size of the Syrian exodus. If, uh, we're at ha almost at half that number now. Uh, half, uh, if 10 million people leave and we have double the size of Syria, imagine what the Syrian exodus did to the European Union in its politics. Imagine what it'll do to our region. The emigration has overwhelmed Colombia, northern Brazil, Peru, and we Venezuelans are the number one asylum seekers in the U.S. A collapsed healthcare system means that people can't take care of their uh, communicable diseases such as uh, AIDS can't be treated, they're moving with the, with the exiles, with the refugees, and malaria and diphtheria have returned. Those who have long-term illnesses like cancer, diabetes, or kidney failure often choose to commit suicide. And suicide is at an all-time high. And then, of course, we have the torture. As you may have read, a friend, friend of several people, there's people in the room who have suffered it themselves, and Fernando Albán was a Venezuelan council member, Caracas council member, who went to the UN to denounce just this year, just now in September, human rights abuses, landed back to resume his day job as an elected um, uh, politician, was taken by the Sabine intelligence services, tortured for three days and tossed out a 10th floor window. Just like the Soviets did in 1948 Czechoslovakia, where my family decided to leave. Imagine if that were your son, your husband, or your friend. He was not a friend of mine, 
but a friend of people here. Lorenz Saleh, uh, his cases, he just came to freedom in, in Madrid after the Fernando Albán scandal. He was so overjoyed at the sight of freedom and the sights and sounds that he refused to sleep because he thought that that was the dream and he was afraid to wake up back in a torture chamber called the tomb. That's all white and clean and he thought it, the deprivation of his senses made, convinced him that he thought he could hear an ant scream. He was so deprived for so long. And yet you hear Lorenz Saleh, or you read his interview, and he's not angry. He still loves his country. He dreams of going back and he loves his fellow man. And that is the spirit of our people. That is the spirit of Venezuela. Venezuelans adjust. They always make do. We have an expression in Venezuela, resolver. Resolver used to mean like, oh, fix a complicated situation, find a way around. Unfortunately, with the crisis, resolver now means to find something to eat, often by rummaging through the trash, to barter something to find medicine for your sick child, or to avoid being taken or killed by the security forces. Resolver now to Venezuela means to find a way to stay alive. What we most need now, what Venezuelans need is hope, well, spiritually what they need, we'll get to the physical needs, is hope, prosperity, and opportunity. They need hope that there's a way out of this crisis, that people care, that leaders will emerge whom they can trust, that democracy will be restored, and that better days lie ahead. We need food, shelter, transportation so that families can, can be together again, and a job that gives us control over our destiny so we don't have to beg our torturers for food. Venezuelans need opportunity. We want to build a Venezuela where we have a chance for our children to go to school, to travel safely, to get a job. But this opportunity needs to be inclusive. It needs to be equal opportunity for all. More equal even than we had in what we call the Fourth Republic, which is the country before Chavismo. After all, we have all suffered the horrors of this cartel. And we need to, as a country, to band together and to say, never again. Never again will we believe this divisive rhetoric that Chavismo wrought upon us, so that we are launched brother and sister against each other. Never again will we give away our rights to governance to a populist leader. Next time, we have to vow that next time we will find a way together. But to get there to that next time, we need to establish a clear and detailed plan for food, jobs, and freedom. All these three things come together. We know that the regime will not allow humanitarian aid. They're the ones who are saying no, not the international community. So these things will only come. We, the open channels for food that is not a tool for our oppression will only come when we eradicate this cartel that pretends to call itself a government. So, to get to prosperity, we need to find, as we, when we transition, and I'll get to how we get there in a minute, because that's going to be your role, <laughs> I'm telling you what we're going to do, I'm going to tell you later what you're going to do to help us. Prosperity requires a holistic solution that can happen, but if we need, we're going to need to tackle ideological populism at its roots. We're going to need to restore the entire system of economy, justice, security, and health care, and restore property rights, rule of law, freedom of transaction and exchange. We'll have to trim down the state in a phased approach. And all of this has to be aimed with the goal of inspiring, once again, the confidence of the Venezuelan people in their government and in their leaders, and the faith of the international community, diplomatic, financial, and otherwise, in Venezuela. We need change now. The Venezuelan economy has contracted by 35%. That's more than the US Great Depression since Maduro took power. We have the highest con uh, interest, uh, highest inflation rate in the world, the biggest economic crisis with the highest interest, uh, interest burden. It means that we will continue to self-destruct. And 
and the economic crisis, which has led to a humanitarian crisis, is entirely man-made, caused by kleptocracy, incompetence, and an ideologically driven power agenda, where spreading money around to spread influence was more important than investing in the future of the country, not investing in the infrastructure or in anything that would make the country produce going forward. That's the ultimate betrayal that our leaders have done to us. The good news is that because it is man-made, so is the solution. If we can find leaders who are competent, practical, and not corrupt, they can turn this situation around. And there, there is a specific agenda that we can do that. The first step, however, is going to be, of course, I, we're going to need to uh, uh, the restructuring of the debt. The Venezuelan, Venezuela is crushed by debt, and that has been done with the complicity of many of many people in the international community. Unfortunately, all too willing to do away with our sovereignty, as were our leaders. The debt is seems to go as follows, as far as we know, because nobody really knows because the the Data hasn't been published in years, and the IMF has not been able to surveil the economy in a decade. $64 billion to bondholders, $20 billion are outstanding to Russia and China, and $5 billion to multilaterals like the IADB, and an uncertain number of tens of billions to expropriation lawsuits and service providers to the oil industry. The bondholders will be litigated here in the U.S. because they were drafted under, under New York law. It's going to be a really long and painful process. Argentina's bondholders sued for 15 years, and Venezuela's is much more complicated. One of the questions, uh, uh, one of the questions that about to do with the debt is whether we, whoever we is in a new regime, would invoke what we call the odious debt doctrine. Odious debt is a doctrine that is. Uh, I actually have worked on it for 20 years, so I definitely would invoke it. The odious debt doctrine is when you have a uh, your illegitimate government, your dictatorship, or an illegitimate body of government that has not followed your own laws, takes out debt for the future generations to be in serious trouble to keep themselves in power, which is exactly what has happened in Venezuela. It has never been tested in the courts. Uh, except now, there's a case in Ukraine, uh, two or three billion dollars loan from the Russians to Yanukovych, which now the Ukrainians are disputing. If Ukraine wins the case against Russia in the UK courts, we're going to want to emulate that. The countries that would suffer the most in that inv invocation would be Russia and China. Of course. The Venezuelan economy needs to be diversified over the next 20 years. And we know that we can do it. And I tell you how I know. Because I worked on the, in Caracas during the time of the diversification of the economy. There was, in early 1990s, we had the Andean Pact, and I personally worked with many other people on developing the competitive strategy toward Colombia, the Andean Pact. We were not always all about oil. It became all about oil by design. And we need to get back our entrepreneurial spirit. One of the questions, of course, about the future scenarios of Venezuela, of how we got there, and one of the things I've been thinking about is the IMF, of course. Everybody says, oh, well, the IMF will issue a rescue package. The question is, the problem is, the only way there will be a rescue is, once again, to get rid of the Maduro regime. Mm -hmm. They have shown that they will not do the reforms, they're not capable, and they're not willing. But, so the preliminary IMF figures are something like 30 to $50 billion a year it would take to restore Venezuela. And they would have to issue that as a loan with reforms attached. It sounds like a lot of money, but they lent that to they lent 50 billion to Argentina this year, so we know they can do that. The question is, what has happened with Venezuela, however, is that three to four hundred billion has been stolen from us. We don't need the IMF if there is a serious attempt at international asset rep repatriation. They give us our money back. We don't need to restructure an international financial package. So the question, as we restructure and we engage with the international community, is how seriously do you want our sovereignty back? Because if you really mean it, you'll give us our money back. 
So what has happened also over the last 35 years, which actually puts it before even the Chavismo came into power, has been a slow and then suddenly accelerating uh, economic collapse. Here's a stunning figure for you. According to Venezuelan economists, if you had invested $1 million on Black Friday, we just had the Black Friday anniversary from 1983, you had invested $1 million, today that would be worth two in Venezuela. That's the kind of destruction of value that has happened in our country. You know, so one of the things that we're discussing that might happen in a reform agenda is dollarization, to dollarize the economy. That would severely infringe our sovereignty, our monetary sovereignty. It means you cannot devalue in order to deal with the shortage in, uh, in a drop in revenue or restriction of international loans. But it would also stop populist policies. Here's another thought. I told you that three to four hundred billion was stolen from us. Dollarization would make corruption in Venezuela an international crime, prosecutable in U.S. courts because it's using the dollar. One of the things uh, we would also need, obviously, to restructure the security and the military. One of the things I, have, I was trying to get at as I was preparing for the speech, and nobody could tell me, not even Ricardo Hausman, our sort of economic god of the Venezuelan opposition, is if we had an annual budget, uh, what would be, what portion of that could we give to the civil service to stabilize the teachers? the healthcare workers and the police, to immediately bring them on board, have them provide services and a secure environment, and to make sure that they are not co-opted by a criminal or insurgent group that would necessarily happen after a transition. So all of this sounds, you know, sounds like a plan, right? The beginnings of a plan, anyway, version one out of what will undoubtedly be 15 different versions down the road when we actually get a chance to have a crack at the numbers. So how do we get there? So the, problem, the thing is, we now need, in order to get back our country, and in order to restore that dream and that love of our country, like I had as a little girl, to millions of other children, and to give them hope and prosperity, we need you here today, listening, watching, to help us resolve it to help us get out of this horrific Venezuelan crisis and help 30 million of my compatriots. We have a plan for that too. And it's really easy and non-violent. Well, I don't know about really easy. That's, that's stating it a bit too strongly, perhaps. <coughs> On January 10th, 2019, Maduro becomes a squatter in the presidential palace. He is no longer a legitimate president. He, his, legitimate, his legitimate term from the 2013 election runs out. This farce of an election he had in May was rejected by 50 countries. Those 50 countries will have, by law, to kick out his ambassadors, or kick out all Venezuelan ambassadors from their countries, suspend their visas, we are asking also that they acknowledge the opposition National Assembly and the opposition uh, Supreme Court in exile, and that they refuse all visas to the regime. These three simple diplomatic actions that are grounded in international law, in nonviolent, would automatically open the door for our liberation. We need the world to acknowledge that this is not a legitimate government, that this is in fact a drug cartel that intends to just squat in our country, seizing power. Once his term is up, we need the rest of the world to follow the law and support us. Stop the talk, follow the law, and help get a dictator out of power. Make the right choice. Once, once that happens, it will be much easier for all of those arrest warrants that are waiting for Maduro and his cabal to be released. And I have supreme faith in our ability to rebuild and the Venezuelan capacity for, for reconstruction and to restore dignity. 
Just last week, I got a text message from a friend of mine, uh, Eduardo Espinel, who runs an NGO in Cucuta, which is sort of ground zero of the Venezuelan exodus, called Venezolanos in Cucuta. And he, I, went to, I met him in February when I went to Cucuta in February, and I went to see the people crossing the bridge from Venezuela into Colombia in the daytime. And then I said, take me out amongst them at night and see where they're sleeping and talk to them and see them harassed by the police. And he said, I need to rent a house so that I can not only house them, but train them to take a ball of wool and knit a sweater so they don't freeze in crossing the Andes. And he did it. Eduardo did it. He texted me last week a film of them celebrating in a picture of the key, and he said, this is the key to hope and, and survival for our people. He is restoring dignity to Venezuelans every single day without any government support. And I know that with that fighting spirit, and now you know that we have a plan, that we know what needs to be done, and now you have a plan for how you can help us. And if we work this together, we can, once and for all, establish, restore the dignity of Venezuela and establish a Venezuela Libre. Thank you. We now have time for questions. I'm assuming there will be a lot of questions. Yes. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm curious. I remember asking this question a year or two ago at a heritage meeting. It, um, at what point does the uh, majority of the military and the internal service, the security services, their, them and their families start getting you know, hungry and upset to the point that uh, there is a coup? Okay. Well, a uh, couple of answers, actually. Uh, there have been a number of fairly serious coup attempts, uh, which is why you have how many military do we have and how many are in the prison? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Anyway, Nobody there's knows. a lot. Over 100? It's yeah. 100 that we know. Well, 100. Many, 24 that we know. Yeah. Okay. At least we know of at least 100 military commanders have been thrown in prison for participation in coup plotting. Mm -hmm. Okay? So there have been attempts. Uh, there are plots. They're very strangled by Cuban intelligence, which is very, very effective. <coughs> the Cubans can't run a country, but boy, can they run an intelligence service. Uh, so, um, so, that's, so we know that their will to rebel is there. Um, the pressure is now growing. I don't know if you've been following the Venezuelan cases of corruption and, and now it was like, well, we know that the commanders are uh, corrupt and now you have the next level of their proxies and then the next level and the next level. And as those guys get turned and they, they'll turn state's evidence because these are, you know, they're not brave people, the pressure on the regime itself will grow. So once you have them declared illegitimate, hopefully on January 10th, and you have the pressure of international indictments and arrest warrants, um, they should get rid of, they, they should probably, hopefully get them on a plane, but otherwise find some, uh, you know, pressure will come from within. The pressure is building. Yeah. And as you say, they're hungry, but the ones who are feeding their families are doing so through massive corruption, which is either drug trafficking, trafficking also of gasoline, uh, which is the cheapest in the world in Venezuela, and you sell it, and I mean, you make millions just instantaneously off one truck. That, that, that and the of money food. is finite. I mean, eventually, there's a finite amount of resources that they can play with. Yes, well, and that's why, uh, that's why you see the Treasury Department closing in. That's why they sanctioned the gold last week, because they're using the gold to keep paying the bond that will keep uh, the PDVSA 2020 bond that keeps them with Sitco here in the U.S. So their options are closing, and that's what the pressure is building. So they'll they'll, they'll crack. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how are countries outside of the Americas reacting to the crisis in Venezuela? And what do you think the reaction will be, particularly from Russia and China, if there are serious threats to Maduro's regime? Well, I don't think either Russia or China are going to put boots on the ground to defend uh, to defend Venezuela. Like, 
they're not they're not taking up you know they, they they were opportunistic they wanted the money they took the oil they'll do some information operations you know they'll do some that kind of thing but they're not sending men with guns in to defend their interests in Venezuelan territory. I don't know anybody who thinks that. Um, the reaction around the world, so that's changing, and that's another reason why I have faith and why, why I took the bold step of talking about a reform agenda today is because I really think, think change is coming, and I think it's coming soon, because also the environment in the region has changed. We have Ivan Duque in Colombia. Bolsonaro was just elected in Brazil. Those countries have their hair on fire with the amount of Venezuelan immigration. We've had, I mean, and it's, you're having um, uh, little, little fights, arms combat, and, you know, little skirmishes, I think is what I want to call them. Little skirmishes on the border in both those countries. Um, and they've had enough. And those countries are overwhelmed. I mean, how do you, they're not, they don't have the capacity to absorb 500,000 immigrants with like no jobs and health care issues. Um, so now they're starting to realize that actually the Venezuela problem is their problem. And at some point, they need to stop the cause of that. The only thing that will stop the immigration is to get rid of the drug cartel regime. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, we've seen the Venezuela diaspora be a key player in how we're going to change the, at least be a support to that change. Either to be, we have Marisela here as the director mm -hmm. of Acción Humanitaria. Oh, so they run something called Visión Democrática, which is a Venezuelan NGO here in Washington, D.C. Yeah, so we, we, what we basically do is we connect the Venezuelan diaspora to the benefit of the economical and social benefit of Venezuela. Mm -hmm. What What's the key in your in this plan, this structure that you're setting out for us? What's, what is your view that the diaspora has to play? What's the role that the diaspora plays? Okay, well, Maria Teresa will roll her eyes because she's heard me say this about 15 times before. <laughs> I only have one topic. Okay, <laughs> military. Military and defense. Military and defense. <laughs> but basically, the, 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 as uh, you alluded, Paul Corey alluded to the brain drain. The diaspora has a tremendous amount of expertise, mm -hmm. yeah. right? I mean, you've got, you know, Harvard professors and, you know, lots of you know, PhDs and military instructors and... People who restructure debt for Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan or whatever, Morgan Stanley, so who are Venezuelan. So one of the things I have wanted to do, and Rafael and I have talked about, is creating a, a network of expertise. And I'm shocked that the Venezuelan opposition leaders haven't done this so far. Uh, because they should, you should set up almost like a shadow government, a group of experts, to show the world that you have the capacity to rule ourselves. But they're not coming. Uh, yes, so that we have the competence. So every time the government comes out with some crazy nonsense about some sovereign cryptocurrency, Petro, linked to some oil, a barrel of oil that's never going to see the light of day, which is, I mean, nonsense from beginning to end, you know, you should have our economic experts push back, fight back, explain why. Um, and every time there's a, a military issue, have people like Maria Teresa, uh, you know, opine on it. And to really form a coalition, coalition of the willing. The irony is that there are so many Venezuelans overseas who, who love their country. Some want to go back and some can't. I mean, I've gotten emails from, you know, Morgan Stanley bankers. They're like, what can I do? I've got this, like, huge job, my American wife and my kids in school. I'm not going back, but I want to help be part of the solution. I want to be at the table and offer my expertise. And I think that's something that we need to do better. And we need to do it fast because January 10th is two months away. And I'm not saying that he's going to be out of there on January 11th, uh, but that's when the pressure is really going to kick in. And I think we need to take this seriously now. And I hope it kicks in because we're pressuring for it to kick in. I mean, not accidentally. Like, this is a, we're, you know, we Venezuelans are trying to drive this. Uh, my name is Yaroslav Matiuk, and I have a similar story to tell from my life. I'm a refugee from communism, and I came to this country at the age of 10. Yay. And, I, and uh, uh, the country of my birth experienced something very similar during the 30s. You know, in 1932-33, there was an artificial famine genocide called the Holodomor. You know, <coughs> it was intended by Stalin to suppress the Ukrainian people in the process. 
and kill six to seven, maybe even ten million people. Okay. Nobody ever knows the numbers on this. No, uh, there is a lot of debate in the Ukrainian community on that. Anyway, um, you refer to the uh, government, uh, to, to what's happening in Odell as a, as a government uh, cartel, drug mm -hmm. cartel, uh, uh, under a populist leader, Maduro, mm -hmm. and you refer to them as an ideologically driven populism. What is the nature of this ide popularly driven ideology? Okay. Is it Marxism, Communism, Socialism, whatever? <laughs> I think it's just a good story that helps give a veil for the kleptocracy, to be honest. <coughs> it's sort of an information operation at writ large. Um, I discuss this actually in my book, uh, in, in, in Blood Profits. And, I mean, technically they call it socialism. But, I mean, what do you call it? Marxism? I just... It's still a drug cartel. Uh, it's still a drug cartel. So basically, so we need... as. As we plan to rebuild the country, we really need to take seriously, and I'm always very emphatic on this point, to understand our mistakes that even allowed Chavismo to happen, right? So we had inequality and, some, and corruption, definitely. But what happened is you ended up with a group that felt marginalized, a polarization in the politics, and, they, and you got a populist leader who looks like the majority of Venezuelans, whereas most of the ruling class were mostly white, and so looked a bit more like me. Chavez looks a bit more like most Venezuelans, you know, the, the ones who felt marginalized. And he seized upon their anger and said, I'm going to reform the whole plan. And that's why I talked about the divisive rhetoric in my speech. That's why I talked about not giving in and not giving away our individual rights as citizens to some populist leader ever again. And he said, I need to rewrite the Constitution. And not only that, give me this... Ley habilitante, this law so that I can just rule by edict. I don't even need to pass anything through Congress. That was the mistake. That was the mistake. That led to the slippery slope. So when he said, um, I'm going to bring you know, equality for everyone, and I'm going to redistribute all the wealth, and I will give away free food, and I'm going to expropriate the land, what people didn't realize is that Chavez was making beggars out of them. And perhaps it's because I grew up, you know, drinking the water of anti-communism because of my family's history, okay? So I'm rab not rabidly, but definitely anti-communist, right? Um, perhaps it's because of that. But, you know, I, I think that your ability to get, a, you know, go to school, come home, yeah, have a school to go to, have transportation to get there, have a job to go to, come back, have a paycheck, and and transact, buy and sell your house when you want, buy and sell a, 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 a business when you want, is to me fundamentally tied to the concept of human dignity. And by the way, it was for Karl Marx too. If you read Karl Marx, he understands that the productive capacity of what you make is intrinsically tied to your dignity. What he got wrong was the solution. Yeah. before you before you leave here, I think this Another Venezuelan. It means that I've been living here 22 years and I'm from Puerto Rico. That's uh, half and half. Okay. Uh, you know, the main motivation for me coming here today is to say what happened after in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. As a U.S. citizen that came this country, that went to vote yesterday because I want to see something. When you say that we can help to change it because we need to make the were no enforced that the ambassadors get removed, the visa get removed. Mm -hmm. As a citizen, as a human being, which one should be my action? Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Make so much noise. Just absolutely annoy everyone you meet with. <laughs> Uh, with the whole issue of Venezuela, and you know, I, I, you know, we do it. Oh, you work at the OAS. Hi. So, would you please change your vote on Venezuela? You know. Oh, hey, you work at the Treasury Department. We got some more bad guys for you. Hey, you know, it yeah. never ends. Oh, you're European. You're the European Parliament. Let me talk to you. And that's literally it. They need to understand that this is an inescapable problem that's just going to haunt their nightmares until they help get rid of this regime. And I, that's our duty to our compatriots, because one of the advantages that we have in being in the diaspora is we have access to all these people. Venezuela can't do this on its own, and that's by design. 
And part of the problem is, part of the reason why we got here is the, all these other groups also took advantage of the corruption in Venezuela, right? They, they found these willing compliance, you know, government people who signed on to these loans, and they've been drinking the blood from this, from the body of our body politic for years. And it can't get up and fight by itself anymore. So the same way it took, in, it took complicity to cause the problem, it's going to take complicity, let's call it collaboration, to fix it. And that needs to be our answer. We need to show two things. That we are strong and that we are willing to fight for our country and that we have the competence to, well, maybe three things, to rule and to keep demanding accountability for what are you going to do to stop this crisis. You can't just keep talking about it. You, these are the actions. And they're easy. I mean, they're written into international law. And that would be a key step, and we can start to take it from there. Sorry. Um, I guess kind of two possible scenarios. Do you see a day that Maduro is drug through the streets like the uh, former president of Libya? Gaddafi. Um, he meets and, a Gaddafi yeah. end. Yeah. And um, yeah. what are your thoughts on January 11th? Um, 10,000 pound Moab sitting on top of his forehead. <laughs> because he's no longer, uh, if, if the U.S. says he's no longer a legitimate leader, he therefore is not protected by those things. Yeah, correct. We don't know what happens on January 10th or January 11th or January 12th. Uh, hopefully a lot. Hopefully, hopefully his own regime will be like, but dude, we're not, we're not protected anymore. Uh, you know that would be that would be the ideal scenario. Uh, I don't. Venezuelans are not all clamoring, you know, to have U.S. troops parading, you know, tanks parading oh, down no. the Avenida Francisco Miranda. Um, but they need to get out. <coughs> and what we do need is for all credible for other threats to be really credible. Whether it's hey, well, I don't know, man, the Brazilians and the Colombians, they're pretty fed up. So are the, you know, so are the Americans, so are the Panamanians. Uh, you've got all of these arrest warrants. You're no longer a legitimate leader, meaning your immunity is cracking. Time to go. Um, and the sooner they go, the better, because as I said, this is a spiraling situation. Uh, you know, the blood of all these Venezuelans and these starving children is on their hands. But is it, it, after January 10th, it will also be on the hands of those who don't have the courage to step up. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I want to I want to give full credit. That whole plan about the not recognizing and the and we says is Moises Rendon right here. No, <laughs> OCSIS, who runs the Americas program at CSIS. He's the genius behind it. I'm just supporting it. Okay. Yes, I've never heard uh, the Trump administration say the word Venezuela once. <gasps> oh okay. no! Yeah, I've they never. Do. I've never heard. It. Okay. So if I've never heard it, maybe somebody else has it. Oh, yeah. So and, um, you may have, but the general public, I don't believe it's um, it's Yeah, he has. He said it in his UN speech at the but UN General I Assembly. Care. I, I don't care. He is able to take personal interest in Korea, in Russia, in Saudi Arabia. If I was his political advisor, I would say, do you want to increase your popularity, Mr. Trump? Mm -hmm. I have an idea. Why don't you go into Latin America a bit? Do you want a win-win case? No. Do you want to uh, be lead a global coalition that would do this? Is this is so appetizing just from a cynical position? Why, if he did mention it, I don't think three hundred Americans are aware of it. No, I, I well, I, I, I will beg to differ on that. Uh, I, he does mention it a lot. Bolton, uh, his national security advisor, gave a, a big uh, speech called it the Troika of Tyranny. Remember the axis of evil? Uh, the Troika of Tyranny. Yes. I'm, I'm totally okay with that. I'm, I'm, I think it's a catchy phrase, and I love a catchy phrase. I'm the one who wrote a book called Blood Prophets, so I love catchy phrases. Uh, and the Troika of Tyranny is Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela because they, employ, they are an alliance, they employ similar tactics. Let me be very clear about this. So, I, as, as Paul mentioned, I'm on Fox News and Fox Business like all the time. And I, I, Venezuelans, we, Venezuelan diaspora, love President Trump. Okay? Like, let me repeat that. We love President Trump. 
because he has stepped up for us. Whatever your personal views on other issues, his attitudes to whatever, whatever other issues, he, this administration has stepped up more for us than any previous administration. Much more than Obama. I've said more. Huh? I have said more. About from doing to saying. Yeah. yeah. Well, the sanctions and everything has been designed to improve it. Now, let me say this. We would like to see more. <laughs> uh, we always want to see more because, as I said, we're cont our country is dying. One of the things, so our, the Venezuelan diaspora, the expat community, has a completely different view of the Trump administration <coughs> than the rest of Latin America. We are, in fact, the new the new Cuban diaspora. One of the things that I think Republicans need to take seriously, and I'm hoping that they will, is that if they do right by Venezuela and continue to, to increase the pressure, they'll have generations of loyalists to the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. They should consider that seriously, because guess where they are? Florida. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait, let me call on the women in the back. Yeah, you in the sweater with the striped sweater. Um, I was kind of thinking, when you mentioned the international pressure on, on maneuver team, I was thinking back to when Trump was first elected, and there were so many questions about Chile, and he had a lot of international pressure, and that led to a referendum um, to ask the people of Chile whether or not they should be interfered in their political sea or no. We get that all the time, Chile. We, get the, we call it the Chile question. <laughs> 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 Many a Ron Diplomatico has been drunk while discussing the Chile question. <laughs> yes. um, right? Yes. Yeah, right? In my backyard and other places. Yeah. Well, what, is the, what is the likelihood of that happening? Uh, none. None. We are so past that point. So basically, I, there are people who will know more about... I, I do not purport to be an expert on Chile, Chilean history, Pinochet, or anything like that. We do have Chilean friends with whom we debate this. Um, they, the, the whole point about having elections that are closely watched by a closely organized opposition group, it, it's just not feasible. The dictatorship is now, the, the surveillance is so strong, the, the people are so desperate and poor that there, there isn't going to be anything like any possibility of, of, of an alternate electoral record. Um, I just don't see that happening. And as I said, we argue amongst ourselves about why. The Chileans and the Venezuelans, yeah. It's, totally it's a totally different situation. Okay. I mean, oh, yeah, the, the, oh, the gentleman behind you with the, yes. Yeah, so going back to the economics, we're talking about uh, the, the, the dollarization of the Venezuelan economy later on. Mm -hmm. And I think you went over like, the bad aspects, but I don't like any good aspects for Venezuela by bagging the currency to the dollar in the way that. Do by dollarizing the economy? Yeah, because they'll have like, more stability and it's in the short term. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's a very good question. So one of the immediate, it's very controversial, but it's gaining. It's the concept of dollarization is gaining currency. Okay. Um, it's. Uh, it used to be. You mentioned it a year ago. People were like, "No, you're a traitor," and now people are like, "You know, maybe not such a bad idea." One of the big immediate benefits of something like dollarization, which is, you know, not easy, and I, I'm no, I mean, I studied economics in undergrad, but that does not qualify me in any way, shape, or form to do a deep analysis on this. But the immediate, one of the obvious immediate effects is it de-risks investment. And if you also have that with something like a, an independent judiciary and better rule of law, then you are going to get investors to be like, hey, let's set up a water system and electricity and, you know, healthcare. So all of those short-term needs that Venezuelans need, people will come in and fund that because at least you won't have the risk of devaluation, populist policies, um, and, and, and you get rid of at least that foreign exchange risk. And, it, and obviously you have to, you know, be able to take your money, you'll be able to take your money in and out. So uh, the, the short-term benefits are fast in that term. It's happening right now. I can show you right now on a menu or an, or an event last weekend where only the, the Maduro people have access to the the cover fee to get in is in US dollars on the menu. The price of the food is on the US dollars. The price mm -hmm. of the borrowed cost to drink at the event is in yeah. US dollars. And the, right now that's happening. Yeah. That's a reality. Yeah, so basically so 
For the Maduro regime, for the people who are well connected, and we also call them the bolichicos, they're like the boli bourgeoisie, mm -hmm. um, everything's dollarized. They already inhabit a dollar economy, they even amongst each other, and even in Venezuela. The rest of the world, who doesn't have access to dollars because it's taken it away, mm -hmm. uh, have uh, exist in a barter economy. So, in a way, because of the hyperinflation, that bit that does function is already dollarized. So we might as well go all the way. Well, uh, what, you had a question? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. You, you in the blue shirt, and then you. Okay. Um, um, I'm moving forward. I'm so glad you're talking about that plan, and let me let me know where to sign in. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, um, well, we're, we're going to register you to vote when we when we have an election. <laughs> um, but as we, and, and with your leadership, are bringing up the plan and a north path towards our restoration, uh, the Russians and the Chinese and the Cubans also have a plan for that day, at that moment, to react. Yeah. On their on their blood sucking um, uh, interest. No. So um, at the same time, um, we I mean I don't know how you say it in English, but in the Venezuelan saying it, una cosa es la que piensa el burro y otra la que el que lo monta. Sí, claro. What <laughs> one thing is what the donkey. Uh, one issue is what the donkey thinks, and the other is what the person riding it thinks. So, so uh, we are thinking about this great. I, I'm all 100% on it. Right. But the, the Chinese are thinking about the same thing right now. Well, they're not going to follow that line. I mean, right? They've gone against the U.S. on its position in Venezuela at every step of the way, as they do on other things like Syria. I mean, it's not just Venezuela, right? So obviously, when the U.S. and the other 50 countries, you know, say, "Hey." kick your ambassadors out, you're illegitimate, Russia and China are going to say, this is a terrible affront to our great ally, and you know, they'll do all their, their thing. I don't know what Maduro's going to do, I mean, is he going to stand there as his, you know, ambassadors get ushered back onto planes? I, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what, I, I don't know what their plan is, I wish I did. Um, I agree that they won't give up immediately, um, but I, I, I don't know what their, what their strategy for pushback on that is. But they, I think they will give up eventually. I mean, once once it's sunk, you know, they're not, as I said, they're not going to put boots on the ground. Nobody thinks that. Oh, sorry, sir, you've been so patient. Just a, a, a comment on, on something you said uh, about Trump and Venezuela. Mm -hmm. I have the same thing in the situation of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Ukrainians love Trump because he did more in one year than Obama did in his eight years. Mm -hmm. He's issued incredibly strong sanctions. He gave Ukrainian the javelins to fight the Russians. Mm -hmm. He is very strongly opposed to uh, North Stream 2 pipeline. Oh, yes. He, uh, there are half a dozen things that his administration done that Obama administration didn't even dream about, mm -hmm. and including Hillary Clinton. Later. Yeah, well, uh, so so our Venezuelan diaspora, I, I hey, Obama's a charming guy, and you know, good looking, mm -hmm. nice to his wife, nice to his kids, great, you know, gays. I love all that. I'm, I'm a social liberal, uh, but uh, in the in the pursuit of the signing the nuclear Iran deal, there was a lot of mapping that they knew how bad the drug cartel ruling Venezuela was. They knew it, and the deal was, well, let's not kick up a fuss. Let's let that roll. Uh, and because and not and and signed the, the deal because a lot of the people with the that tie the Venezuelan drug trafficking to Hezbollah to Iran entailed some of the people with whom you were negotiating. My contention is that was a terrible mistake that has cost us a lot. I think they if you want to pursue the nuclear Iran deal, which is a whole other issue, I'm not even going to get into that. You could have pursued the criminal activities and the Hezbollah and all of that still, but. Obviously, the Obama administration didn't agree with me, and nobody asked me anyway, so here we are. Now, I remember in 2014, the State of the Union, President Obama addressed the, um, how, how the Venezuelan regime was actually killing so many 
of our youth and, mm -hmm. and how strong-armed they were. And also in 2014 was the passing of the first sanctions. That lobby was bipartisan, and that was immediately passed. And it had a lot to do with the lobby that um, the ambassador of the Organization of American States at the time, during the Obama administration, kept pushing for when the rest of the region was actually accusing, again, the U.S. and playing the interventionist, um, accusing of the interventionist. The one thing I would say is the Obama administration has always, was con continuously shied away from that name calling, you know, and from being seen as interventionist. Mm -hmm. But I don't see how, I really, I'm, I'm hopeful that the Trump administration would do more. I don't see how it to first in action because all of, I've heard Venezuela in the State of the Union during the Obama administration. I've heard Venezuela in the State of the Union um, from President Trump or actually the speech at the UN. Mm -hmm. I see oh. sanctions being passed within both administrations. I don't see the action being further. I'm hopeful that they will be. Um, but I still feel that a lot of other international deals are taking precedence over Venezuela in both administrations. So while um, well, you could see a good, and, and, and the Republican Party is being very aggressive at recurring Venezuelans in the south of Florida. I, I think it's um, a poor assessment on, on our end. I, I think it's, it's playing into our emotions will change, our hope will change. Because I've seen the same type of actions, just maybe a stronger tone on one end than the other. Well, I think they've taken a lot more actions. Okay. Okay, I think, to, to be fair, you know, the Trump so administration has taken a lot, well, uh, just many, many more sanctions, yeah. mapping out the criminal activity and the corruption. I mean, there's, I don't even know how many people are sanctioned right now. Uh, uh, it's got to be approximating 100. It was over 60 last time I checked, and that was before. Well, we got to give credit to the Treasury Department during the Obama administration. Yeah. Because that's where it's I mean which was the first big, right. big fish that the yeah. Trump administration gave, could not have been done in the first two months of the administration. What is the that, conflict between Obama and No, 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 yeah, I know. But no, it's, it's not. I mean, I don't want to get into U.S. politics of Democrat versus Republican. No. <laughs> no, I personally... The, I guess the issue is what's going to make it relevant enough for, for us. For this, for like, what we need to focus on, yeah. okay, our country's dying. And yeah. we have an opportunity two months from now to do something about it. I really urge everyone who ever cared about Venezuela in any way, shape, or form, because you're from there, or you had a friend, or you fell in love, you know, your ex-girlfriend, your high school, your first sweetheart was a Venezuelan girl, whatever, uh, you know, please, please keep up the pressure and the messaging to, if you're uncle is Spanish, drive him nuts, telling him that please, they need to support uh, you know, stop uh, legitimizing a drug cartel that actually has no legal basis to stay in the presidential palace on January 10th. So that's what you that's what you can do concretely. Um, that's the role of the diaspora is to keep the pressure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, you have a question in the back. Yeah. I was just quickly going to ask you if, if you if you are concerned, if people in your space are concerned by the results uh, last time, especially in the south of Florida, the, the Democrats flipping two seats that were supposed to be safe GOP, um, hold, uh, seats that the GOP was supposed to hold, specific, especially when you think of the two, two of the people that were most vocal in driving the sanctions bill, Pompeo and uh, Ross Lehman's uh, supposed, uh, I mean, expected uh, successor. These two people were, uh, there was a lot of hope that these people were gonna keep no. the pressure on. And when you think of the Democrats, you can trust that they will come around on the right side of the issue, but they're not going to rack up Venezuela as high up on their agenda as the Republicans and the Nationals. So do yeah. you trust that the Democrats will flip those two seats in such important parts of the country? Do you trust that they will advocate this as loudly as you well, I Well, I hope so. First of all, we were just discussing this, and I think, what was the consensus, you think? So I, I, you, why don't you start? I, I, I believe that it shouldn't be an issue. Uh, Senator Engel, who will be the chairman for that committee, specifically for foreign affairs, has been a great ally, has been, a, has been as strong of a, of, of a supporter of, like, Ileana Ruth Latham, Anna Corbello, and DeSantis, who used to be the former chairman, worked very well, well close together. I don't see an issue. I think they will be very, will stay close to the community, they'll keep up the good fight, and... But the, is it, are, are, you, are you concerned, though, that, um, Although they, they are, they it's are. Perfect. You can. 
Why don't you address it? Why don't you answer the question of the microphone? Talk about the committee. Yeah, no, we got about one minute left. Okay, one minute. Just very quick. I, I really don't feel. I feel congressmen have a, have they they respond to their constituency. They have a Venezuelan constituency who elected them, mm -hmm. and they will keep them in the good fight. They, yeah. The issue is that and we need to, and, and it's a bipartisan issue. Well, it is. I, I think we should take that issue outside of South Florida and Miami. It should be a 50 state wide issue. That's right. Where are you from? Uh, Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. <laughs> I'm sure we get people here from Washington, <laughs> Illinois, from, ev from every part of the United States. Pick up your phone and call them. Hey, he's an activist. I actually think that it's important for you to take action in Venezuela yeah. because yeah. it's my mother, her, her grandparents. There are uncles who are dying every single day because there's no medicine, there's no food, and only because there's a narco dictatorship in Venezuela who is taking everything away from them. Yep. That's right. Terrorists. Terrorists. Yeah, okay. Well, thank, right. thank you. We have one other time.